Amen. I want to get right into the Word of God this morning. The Lord has laid something on my heart that uh, really just been burning inside, and and even if it was, even if it's not a blessing to you this morning, boy, it sure has been a blessing to me studying it to to hear from the Lord in this passage. So, if you would go ahead and find in your Bibles Psalm forty-two. Psalm 42, when you find that, you can stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 42, and we're going to read the first five verses of this psalm. If you found it, say amen. 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 This is what it says, as the heart, or that's a deer, panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. Verse 5, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. I've simply titled the message this morning, A Search for God. A search for God, or you might say a pursuit of God. You may be seated. You know, as I, I often will take commentary of passages of Scripture as I'm uh, st- I study every morning, and, I'll, and I'll often, if something stands out to me as far as a, a scripture or a phrase, I'll often make commentary about those things. And as I was looking and praying and searching for what God would have me to bring uh, this morning, earlier this week, as I came across some things that I had written about this very psalm, the Lord just burned this in my heart so much to the point, and I, and I don't mind to tell you that I wept over this passage of Scripture as I read it, that God just put that in my heart as I was reading this. God just really moved on my heart, and so I know that as I'm bringing this message this morning, I know that God can speak to you right where you are. I know that God can speak to Uh, He can go past all your walls and all the barriers that you have, and the Word of God can pierce right down to the very core of a person. And I believe that if you'll approach this with an open heart this morning, that you're going to find God will minister to you. I'm reminded of a a phrase Chuck sent me just the other day about Corey Ten Boom. She said, look around and be distressed. Look within and be depressed. But look at Jesus and be at rest. She knew something of being discouraged. I was uh, reading a story earlier about Mickey Mantle, the great baseball player. And uh, he talked about how he had a particularly bad day uh, in baseball. He struck out three times in a row, did terrible. And he said he was so overwhelmed by it, he just went back into the... Back into the uh, into his dugout or, or to the, the clubhouse. And he said he just put his, his face down in his hands and he was just at the place where he was ready to cry. You know, just a, one of those days. And he heard somebody come in and it was actually uh, Yogi Berra's little boy. And uh, he came over to him and and tapped him on the knee, and Mickey says, I thought he was about to say something nice to me and say, you hang in there, buddy. But he said he just stared at me, and all of a sudden, in his little kid voice, he said, you stink. (laughs) 
Sometimes people aren't very encouraging. (laughs) That was not a timely word for Mickey Mantle. And sometimes people are not very encouraging, you see. And the psalmist in this 42nd Psalm, some say that this is David. It doesn't give us a clear uh, answer as to whether it's David, but some say uh, they liken it to David when he fled from Absalom and there was a rebellion in the kingdom. Some say it would be that. It doesn't give us a specific answer about that. But the psalmist in this is a man who is despairing. He's discouraged. His heart is overwhelmed in him, and he feels far from God. And there's a longing in his heart, and there's a thirst in his heart, and he knows that he has a need that can only be met by God. And he's in pursuit of God. He, he knows that if I can just reach God, if I can just see my God, if I can just be in the presence of my God, it's what I need. And there's a longing, there's a deep desire in the psalmist's heart. And I believe that some of you this morning and some who are perhaps listening can relate. You feel as though God is very distant sometimes. You feel as though God is very distant. The, heaven, uh, the heavens are brass and you can't break through. You feel like your prayers come out of your mouth and they roll off your lip and they hit the ground. They just don't seem to have flight, and uh, you just seem overwhelmed. You're discouraged, and there's a longing inside of your heart still yet to be revived, to be renewed. You want to be restored. There's a desire inside of you for the water of life, that refreshing drink of water. And this morning, as I'm speaking in this psalm, I want you to know that God has not forgotten you. I want you to know this morning, if you're one of these people, and as we go through this psalm and we look at this and you say, I feel this in the depths of my soul, I want you to know that God has not forgotten you. I want you to know that there's still mercy for you. I want you to know that there's still grace for you. I want you to know that there's still hope for you. I'm saying to you this morning, don't give up. God is good. God is willing to come he will pass by. This too will pass, and you will sing again. You will sing again. We're talking about the pursuit of God, and there's something in his heart that says, more than anything, I need my God. You've had times in your life where, where the heart's desire that you had, the only one thing would work. I think about a simple one, and we probably all experienced in Missouri's summertime heat, and it's 187 degrees outside. I got that from the Weather Channel. Don't, don't verify my sources. But 187 degrees, and you're out mowing the grass, and there's not a cloud in sight or a tree. So didn't there used to be a tree here, a shade or something? And the tree has even moved, and you're in the hot sun, and you're pushing the grass, and it's knee-high because you didn't want to do it sooner because it was hot outside, so you waited as long as you could before the city would start calling you, you know. And the sun's beating down on you, and you're turning red like a lobster, and you're getting squishy like SpongeBob. And uh, while you're doing that, you're, all you're thinking about in your mind You're not thinking about, boy, I sure would love to have a hot cup of coffee. Mmm, hotter the better. No, you're not thinking about some thick, creamy chocolate milk. No, you have one thing in your mind. Get out of this sun and get a cold drink of water. Because nothing else is going to do for you. You just know that I've got to have this right now. And the psalmist is giving us this picture with a deer. It's the pursuit of God. Look at verse 1 again. He says, as the heart or the deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. See, the scene is of a deer, and he's longing for water. And some would say it's like uh, a deer that was being pursued by an enemy, hunted down by a predator perhaps, running and, and being chased, and, and he's weak, and he's at the point of exhaustion, and he can't go any longer. Or maybe you could say 
one that for an extended period of time, there's been a drought and he can't find water. And so everywhere he searches, he looks, and every place that he goes, he finds that the brook is dried up. What used to be a stream, I can't get a drink there now. And the picture is that of that this water to this deer means more than anything else. That if this deer can't get the water, then he can't live. If the deer can't find the source of life, then he can't live. And the psalmist is saying, as water is to that deer, so is God to my soul. He's saying, as water is to that deer, God, that's who God is to my soul. And more than anything in my life, I want to find the source of life who is my God. And he's in pursuit. He's in pursuit of God. And there's a deep longing inside of him. There's a deep longing inside of the psalmist. He has a need. He's troubled. He's thirsty. He's come to the end of himself. And he knows that God can meet his need and only God can bring the refreshing and the spiritual nourishment that he so desires. And he has this deep longing and he's in pursuit of God. And he knows that God is the source of life. You all know in this room, and those that are older than me know better than anybody that this life is filled with trouble, that there's going to be difficult times in our life, that there are times when God seems silent, that there are times when we may feel abandoned, but God has not abandoned you. God has not abandoned you. There's times of intense pressure in our lives where we're just overwhelmed, but I say to you this morning, pursue God. You may be feeling overwhelmed this morning, but pursue God. You may feel like you don't have the strength to go any further, but pursue God. You may have, you may be the end of yourself, and you don't know what to do, but I'm saying to you, pursue God. Don't let that longing go away. Pursue God, because he is the source of life, and there's places in our life that only God can meet our needs. There's only things that God can only meet. Not only does he have a deep longing for God, but there's a desire for fellowship. There's a desire for fellowship with God. Look at verse two. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before my God, before God? See, he has a desire for fellowship. There's a longing here for the presence of God. There's a cry in his heart that says, God, you're all that I want. There's a cry in his heart that says, God, you're all that I need. He's in pursuit of God, and he longs for the presence of God, and he longs to come before the living God. You know, the presence of God brings peace. The presence of God will bring peace to a troubled soul. I think of the disciples that were gathered after the crucifixion of Jesus, and it says that they were assembled for fear of the Jews. And Jesus rose again from the grave, and he appears to them, and he says, peace be unto you. When Jesus shows up, he brings peace with him. In the presence of God, there is peace that comes And this morning as we are lifting our voices in worship to God, God was coming near to the people of God. And there was a peace that began to wash over some souls in this place. There was some peace that began to come because here in this place, in this house, we've gathered as God's church and the presence of God is here. And when you're in the presence of God, there's peace and there is joy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In verse 3, he says, my tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Now, this psalmist's experience was one of sorrow. He says, tears were my meat day and night. He said, food, he was more or less saying, food is gone from me. I I don't feel like eating. I don't want to eat. I I don't want nothing to do with it. I'm so sorrowful in my heart. And all that I have, my daily, my daily supply of food is just tears that I'm crying because I'm overwhelmed with grief. The psalmist was saying, I'm overwhelmed and, and day and night the tears are my food that I eat. His experience was one of loneliness and isolation. He felt as if he was all alone. 
In a world of billions of people, you can feel all alone. But in God's eyes, you're never lost in the crowd. Think of the woman with the issue of blood, and she said, if I can just push through and touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And she did, and the crowds were pressing on him all around, and she touched, and she was healed, and and Jesus said, who touched me? The disciples said, they're all around you. Everybody's touching you. What do you mean? He said, no, someone touched me because God knew the individual in the midst of the crowd. You're never lost in the crowd in this world. God knows who you are. Not only is it an experience of loneliness and isolation, but it was an experience of cruel mockings. He said, the enemy is continually saying to me, where is your God? On top of his thirst and his his hunger and his sorrow that he's feeling in his heart, the enemy comes and he says, and by the way, the God that you talk about, that you serve, the God that you say you love so much, where is he? Why are you feeling this way? You know, sometimes God will allow us to go through difficult places to turn our eyes to him. We can't always understand why we go through what we go through. But we can always rest assured that God knows what's going on. And he is working things together for good. And so the psalmist is overwhelmed and he's thirsting and he's in pursuit of God and he's looking for that fellowship and he says, day and night I'm weeping and all I can do is, it's just all that I can do to keep going. It's, it's all that I have to keep going. And in the midst of the pursuit, the enemies, they're mocking him and they're pointing out his failures and they're pointing out his shortcomings and they're trying to distract him and they want him to give up on God completely. They want, him, they want to convince him to, to go after everything but the one who can give life. In the midst of our troubles and, and the things that we face in life, the enemy wants to do everything to get us off on some, other, on some other thing, to not look at God, to not follow after God. The enemy wants to draw our attention away and do anything he can to pull our eyes off of God to the one person that can give us life, to the one person that can help us, to the one person that can meet our need. And the enemy wants to get our eyes on everything else. He wants to tear you down. He wants to question God, and he wants to try to mess with you. So many people have that in their mind. They say, if I can just get a better job, if I can just have a little bit more money, if I can just get a nicer car, if I can just have this, and if I can just do that, and if I can just, if I can just, and all the while, it's the enemy whispering to you. And there's one source of strength. There's one hope of life. And not only that, but he was remembering better days. But he was doing it the wrong way. The psalmist was remembering better days, but he was doing it in the wrong way. This is important. Look at verse 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. He said, boy... I'm remembering those good old days. The only problem was he's remembering them in the wrong way. Because what should have brought joy was bringing him sadness. It was grieving his heart. He he had known the hand of God. He had known the blessings of God. He had known the joy of God. He had known the grace of God. He had known all the good things of God. And now he finds himself in a dry place. And oh, how he longed for fellowship with God. Oh, how he longed for the presence of God. And when he thought about those better days, he thought about those better days that was causing him to grieve in his heart. And he was sorrowing, pouring his soul out within him. Let me say this. Praise God for the mountains you have climbed, even if you are remembering them from the valley. Let me say that again. Praise God for the mountains you have climbed, even if you are remembering them from the valley. (laughs) See, the blessings of our past should speak hope 
to our present circumstances. Not condemnation. Take those memories of good things that God has done in your life. Take those memories of blessings and joys and good things that God has done in your life and don't let them be a point of condemnation because you're in the valley, but instead let them be a point of hope in your heart that says, I know that God has done it in the past and I remember, oh, it was so good and I'm praising God. I may be in the valley right now, but I know because he did it back then, he can do it up here where I am now because he moved in my life back then. I know he can move in my life again and though I may be in the valley, I'm going to remember those mountaintops even if I have to do it in the valley. Don't allow your memories of times with God to be a point of condemnation in your life. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And so if we are to walk as victorious and blessed in our life, then we need to take those memories of the good times with God, even in the bad times, and let them spur us on to hope. He was remembering in the wrong way. That's so important. Your, your salvation experience may have been glorious. And that was for the time and for the place, and you hold that in your heart, dear to your heart. But you're not going to have a replication of that event every day. You're going to grow in grace. You're going to increase in the things of God. But you're not just going to replay that in your mind over and over again because you can end up starting to condemn yourself about it. Why isn't it this way? Oh, I felt a certain way back then. I felt, I felt this or I felt that or I knew God said this. I knew he did that. And you begin to condemn yourself with it. When instead you should take that as that glorious day where Jesus saved me, that glorious day and tell of the good news of God and tell of the grace of God and tell of all the things that he's done for you. But don't condemn yourself with it and know that God has made wonderful memories in the past and God is going to make wonderful memories in the present and in the future. Every day, it's something new. Every day, God has new blessings and new mercies. Don't condemn yourself over the past because you don't feel the way today that you used to feel back then. Does that make sense to everybody? I hope I explained that clear enough. But let those blessings speak to you. Now, here's here's what I want to say. We're getting into the really important stuff in the message here. The psalmist chose hope in the midst of a trial. The psalmist chose hope. I was reading in the Treasury of David by, uh, by Charles Spurgeon, and he quoted a man by the name of Samuel Smiles. And Samuel Smiles said this, hope is like the sun, which, as we journey towards it, casts the shadow of our burden behind it. Hope is like the sun which as we journey towards it casts the shadow of our burden behind it. You know when you set your eyes on Jesus, the son of righteousness, and you begin to focus in on his glory and his majesty and his blessings and his joy, those despairs and those burdens begin to cast their shadows back there. You're not looking at them. Because you're directly facing the son of glory. That's hope. That's hope. That's hope. When you look to Jesus, that's what hope can do. What seems so ominous and right there around you is suddenly put behind you. And so, verse 5, let's read this. He chooses hope. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me, or at war, at turmoil inside? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. See, the psalmist begins speaking to himself. The psalmist begins talking to himself. Now, this is going to seem a little odd to you at first. I heard somebody uh, talking about this the other day. It's going to seem a little strange to you at first, but watch this. There's a man by the name of uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. 
Westminster Chapel. He took the place of G. Campbell Morgan. If you're familiar with famous old preachers, this is a famous old preacher. And he wrote a book called Spiritual Depression. And he talked about this very psalm in his book. I want to read you just a short paragraph what he said because it's important uh, to this message, and I think it will help you. Jones says this, have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but there they are, talking to you. They bring back the problem of yesterday. Somebody's talking. Who's talking? Yourself is talking to you. Now, this man's treatment in Psalm 42 was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? He asks. His soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, Self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. Amen? That's good, amen? The psalmist had been listening to himself. Do you see that in this verse 5? We, we've been looking at it, the grief and the sorrow and all the things that he's feeling. And he gets to verse 5 and he says, wait a minute. I'm going to choose hope. See, some of you need to stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. And you're saying, look, I'm already crazy enough. I don't need any help. But this, the truth is still there. The voices in the morning that begin to chew on you. Like he was saying, they're already there. And they already start messing with you as soon as you wake up. That's that, that, that echo, that daily thing that starts happening in your mind. And it's wearing on you and it's wearing on you. And the psalmist is saying, wait a minute. I'm tired of listening to myself. And now I'm going to talk to myself. <laughs> it's good. It's good. See, he starts talking to himself. He demands his soul to give an answer. You see that? He says, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? He says, soul, give an answer for yourself. He demands his soul to give an answer. He's overwhelmed. He's lonely. He's discouraged. He's depressed. He's in trouble. And yet he says to himself, soul, hope thou in God. <laughs> Some of you need to start talking to yourself and stop listening to yourself. Some of you need to say, you know what? I'm going to start hearing from God. I'm going to start talking about the blessings of God. I'm going to start talking about my Savior and the blood that he shed for me and my sins that were forgiven and the fact that I've got a home in glory. I'm tired of listening to myself. I'm going to start talking to myself about the goodness of God, about the mercy of God, about the grace of God. God. And before you know it, you find yourself just don't even want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> oh, that's so good, isn't it? Hallelujah. The Bible says at one point David was so discouraged and they were going to stone him because there was a lot of turmoil that was going on and David was so discouraged and they, the people with him was going to stone him and the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. What was David doing? He said, shut up, David, I've got something to say. And David started talking to himself about the creator, about the glorious God that he served, about the God in heaven that knew his circumstance. He knew the situation that he was in, and David started talking to himself. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. You may not understand what's going on. You may be totally just overwhelmed with everything. You can't shake it off. You've tried to shake it off, but you can still praise God, and you can still talk to yourself, and you can still say, self, I've had enough of you, and I'm talking about my Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Ephesians chapter 5 says this, and I know it's talking about the context of a church, but listen to this, Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Speaking to yourselves, that's what it says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Amen. I don't know what to talk to myself about. Well, how about a psalm? How about a Psalm 42? I don't know what to say to myself. Well, how about a hymn? Maybe you like singing. (laughs) Spiritual songs, whatever. The book of Romans 8.28 says what? And we know that all things work together for good. Here's a good topic for you. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We also have the one that says, and what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, that's interceding at the right hand of God the Father. Oh, hallelujah. These are some things you can talk to yourself about. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation or distress, persecutions, famine, nakedness, peril, or the sword. As it is written, all we are killed all the day long, accounted as sheep for the slaughter, but nay, and all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Take that, self. That felt good. You say that with me. Take that, self. Take that, self. Amen. And the psalmist is going to turn his complaint to a prayer. Verse 6. Oh, my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I, what? Remember thee. From the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill Mizar. Basically, the, the, the center of worship was Jerusalem. And he's saying, I'm far from the place of worship that I desire to be. He's saying, from a distant place, I'm going to... Pray to my God, and I'm going to remember him. Because the psalmist recognized it was necessary to choose hope. It was necessary to choose hope. It was necessary to turn his attention to God. And he knew his God, and so he cried out, my God. He cried out, my God, because the psalmist knew his God, and he was choosing to remember the one who could bring help. Not only that, but God can meet the depths of your sorrow with the depths of his grace. God can meet the depths of your sorrow with the depths of his grace. Look at verse 7. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. The psalmist is being honest about things. Wouldn't you say he's pretty honest? He's just, you know, not every Christian walks around. <laughs> I was born with this. I came out this way. I didn't even cry when I was born. Just smiling. Other people cry. Yeah, I don't do that. I'm a Christian. That's not, to, that's not real. But the psalmist was real, right? The psalmist was being real. And he gives the image now of a waterfall, water spouts. He gives the image now of a waterfall. And he's saying what's happening is the waterfall is crashing down into an already troubled sea. So the water's coming down, and the waves are already wave after wave. And guess where the psalmist is? He's under the waterfall as wave is crashing upon wave. And he feels as if he's going down, down, down into the depths of despair. 
So he feels like he's drowning. Can you see that in this? He feels like he's drowning. He says, deep calleth unto deep. And the waves are crashing on him and he's despairing. But he finds hope. He finds hope. Look at verse 8. Yet the Lord. Isn't that good? Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me in my prayer unto the God of my life. Yet the Lord, when you're despairing, yet the Lord. When you're broken, yet the Lord. When you're discouraged, yet the Lord. When you're downcast, yet the Lord. When you're overwhelmed and you can't go another step, yet the Lord. It's not over. Why? Yet the Lord. <laughs> Yet the Lord. Now, I want to come back to this phrase, deep calleth to deep. There's something more we can gather from us, and it's beautiful. See, the psalmist recognized the depth of his trouble. You know, he's talking, I'm being pushed down in the wave after wave after wave. And he recognized the waterfall in an already troubled sea, and he's going down, down, down. And he recognized the depth of his trouble, but he also knew the depth of the power of his God. We just read that, yet the Lord. His situation was bleak, but God can meet the problem at any level. You realize that? That God can meet the problem at any level, and, and there is no tragedy or trouble too deep that the depths of God's grace cannot match. Deep calls to deep. Stay with me here. The depths of God's mercy calls to the depths of our need. The depths of God's grace calls to the depths of our need. So what he's saying, though my troubles are deep, so is the help of my God. Though my sorrows are deep, so is the comfort of my God. Though my wounds are deep, so is the healing of my God. Though my weakness is deep, so is the strength of my God, because deep calls to deep. Wherever you may go, wherever you may find yourself, wherever, how far down in the depths of despair you go, God is there because deep calls to deep. When you're broken, deep calls to deep. When you don't know where to go, deep calls to deep. God is deeper than your problems. Wow. Oh, that's good. David said in Psalm 139, I want to read a few verses. David understood this. Psalm 139, verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. It makes no difference to God, because he's God. And deep calls to deep. God can meet you in whatever place you find yourself. And he goes on to say that all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. How do we, how do we reckon that? You know, basically there's nothing that happens in our life that God doesn't know or allow. God is the sovereign God of the universe. And there are many dark places that we just simply cannot understand. But God does. 
So even if thy waves are his waves, for some reason he has ordered them. But he will also sustain you in them because he's working something for good. All things are not good, but he works all things together for good for his people. And deep calls to deep. So with that being said, God has you covered day and night. This is, uh, I, I enjoy this portion of the message in particular. God has you covered day and night. Look at verse 8 again. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night. His song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. We're going to experience times of intense trouble. No doubt about it. You know that. And we're going to feel those deep waves crashing on us. We're going to experience those things. Many of you have already experienced those types of things in your life. And, and this world, it's plagued by those things. You know that. But the heart of God is on his people at all times. The heart of God is on you this morning where you are. He knows everything about you. And there's never going to be a time in your life when God has forgotten you. Not a moment, not a second, not a, not a lapse of mind like I have all the time when I forget, did I leave my socks in the living room or? Oh, I'm wearing them. Okay, I can go now. God doesn't have that kind of stuff like we do. God is always... He's all-knowing. He knows everything. And <clears throat> Matthew Henry said this. He said, let us never think that the God of our life and the rock of our salvation has forgotten us if we have made his mercy, truth, and power our refuge. If we're hiding in Christ, if we are finding our refuge in Christ Jesus, we must never think that we've been forsaken because God has promised us that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And in the morning, the Lord is with us. He gives us new morning, new mercies every morning. Lamentations chapter 3, you know the verse, 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God's got us covered in the morning with new mercies. Charles Spurgeon says, his mercies are new every morning and fresh every evening. And who can know the number of his benefits or recount the list of his bounties? I love that. Not only is the mercies new every morning, but they're fresh in the evening. See, God alone knows the difficulties of the day that you're going to face. And so with the new day, he gives you a new batch of mercies. God understands what you're going to face. He knows every day the things that are going to be coming your way. And so every morning he says, I know what this day holds. And so with this day, here's a brand new batch of mercies. Just cooked them up. And the wonderful thing is the mercies from yesterday are still fresh. And he gives you new ones. He's got us covered in the, in the morning. In the daytime, the Lord is with us. He sustains us. See the verse 8? It says, the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. It's in the daytime that the difficulties of life come our way. It's in the daytime that uh, we're hit with worries and troubles and we feel the stresses of life, uh, family members, um, the stresses of work. We have responsibilities that we have to meet. It's in the daytime. These things are coming your way. Your people are out and about and they're active. There's the hustle and, and the bustle. And it's in the daytime that those things are happening. It's the daily grind. And it's saying God is going to command his loving kindness in the daytime. See, when you're troubled in spirit, as the psalmist was, even the small things feel like 
big things. If you've ever been to that place, you know what it's like, that, that even the little things are just monstrosities. I mean, they're, you just, they're mountains to you. And it's in the daytime we often feel that way. And, and so the Bible says that God is going to command his loving kindness in the daytime. It, it's, you know, the beautiful thing, it's blessing enough to say that God was going to give us his grace and mercy. But not only that, the Bible says that he's going to command it. He's going to command his loving kindness. He's going to put out a divine decree that says, I have reserved my mercies and my grace for my people. And if God has commanded it, who's going to restrain it from happening? (laughs) If God sends out the command, who's going to prevent it? Oh, my. Oh, my. See, God has mercy reserved for his people and grace and joy. And uh, what an awesome God he is. And not only that, but he's got us covered in the nighttime. Here's... Here's the most troubling time, isn't it? The night time. It's in the night when your mind is troubled the most, isn't it? All is silent. You're left to the stillness of the darkness. The shadows of your past seem to materialize in the darkness. The sorrows that unfolded earlier that day seemed to grow larger and larger and larger. The wounds from your past seemed so fresh, even if they happened 30 years ago. The voice of the enemy seems nearer than ever before, doesn't it? Temptations. The voice of the enemy is near. And it's here in that troubled darkness like the ancient mariners out in the boats. They cast their anchors and they hope for day. But what does verse 8 say? It says, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me. His song shall be with me. Here's, here's what I wrote down in my, in my tablet as I was looking at this. This part of the message means so much to me. His song and my prayer. His song and my prayer. See, it's in the hours of darkness that he never forsakes us. And in the night, the darkness comes and those thoughts are arising and temptation is also strong. And his song is with me. His songs of love, his songs of mercy, his songs of grace, his songs of deliverance, his songs of compassion, his songs of truth. In the night, his song is with me because the Bible says he gives us a song in the night. And in the night, his song is with us. The book of Zephaniah 3.17 says this, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. His song, it talks about, I know he's talking about his people in Israel. He's talking about the nation in Israel. And just as God says, I will sing over my people, Israel, with joy, so he will sing over his children with joy in the night when things seem so difficult, when trouble seems so real, when wounds are so fresh, when the tempter is there and the enemy is whispering, his song is with you and he is singing over you with joy and he is singing over you with peace and he is singing over you his people because he joys in his children hallelujah though we don't feel him always God is singing over you can you imagine you think about beautiful singers you hear on earth and can you imagine the angels singing and the glory of that 
<laughs> but can you think of Jehovah God singing when he begins to stand up from his throne in majesty and glory, and he says, that's my children, that's my people, and I'm going to rejoice over them with singing. And I can imagine that all the hosts of heaven stand back in astonishment at the glory and the majesty of almighty God, rejoicing and singing over his people with joy. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, praise God. <laughs> Oh, what a mighty God. And so it is that his song is with you in the night. His song and my prayer. See, my case may be sorrow and gloom, but my prayer is to the God of my life. That's what it says in the last part of that, of that verse 8. And my prayer unto the God of my life. It's his song and my prayer. Though my case may be difficult, God is singing over me. And my prayer is going to be the God to the God that created heaven and earth. My prayer is going to be the God who sits on the throne in glory. My prayer is going to be to the God who creates light and form darkness and it's all the same to him because he is the king of glory and he rejoices over me and it's his song and my prayer to the God of my life. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm coming to the last part of the message now and I'm going to wrap it up real quick. Look, the psalmist pours his heart out to God. He was honest in this psalm. And I want you to know this morning, it is okay to pour out your heart to God. Look at verse 9 and 10. I will say unto, the God, unto God my rock, why hast thou forsaken me, forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? He's just being honest, folks. He's just making an honest prayer to God. The psalmist is just being honest with God. He believed with all of his heart, God is his rock. You do too. I believe that we have people. You believe that God is your rock. He's your refuge. He's your strength. You know that. But there are times he just feels so far away and his burden was still heavy. His burden was still heavy, and his heart was still broken, and he's still troubled. And the words of his enemies are, are like swords piercing into his bones. And he felt that God had forgotten him, but God can never forget us. We're engraved on the palms of his hands. God knows us. He knows us. And so the broken psalmist, he takes his complaint to God, and he just gives an honest prayer. Just an honest prayer. Have you ever made an honest prayer to God? If you've ever been through something, you probably have. And you know the beautiful thing is, it, is God's not mad at you for that, <laughs> right? Because you never surprise God. We have in our in our mind, somehow we think that there's parts that we hide away from God, and God didn't hear that I said that part. God seen it all. He heard it all. He knew it all before it came out of your mouth, and you will never, ever surprise God, and God wants an honest heart. God's not impressed by your words. He's not impressed by your eloquence. He just is looking for an honest heart, even if it's broken, and asking him why. That's what God wants. The Bible says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. See, we have a high priest in heaven, and he's felt all the things that we have felt. 
Jesus Christ lived among us as, as a man. He has experienced everything that we've experienced. He has known everything that we have known. He has endured the mental anguish, severe agony, agony upon agony. He went to the cross and he bore the full weight of the sins of all of mankind, your sin and my sin, and he put himself on the cross. He, he was crucified on Calvary and his blood was shed as payment for my sin. It was forgiveness of my sin. He bore the full wrath of God and God uh, uh, poured out his wrath upon his son as he was paying for our sin debt and Jesus on that cross he asked a why question for every single one of us when he said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me Jesus asked the why question for every one of us but here's the beautiful thing there's glory after the cross. After the cross, there's glory. Jesus rose again from the grave. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father this morning. And there is glory after the cross. You're bearing a cross this morning. Church, there is glory after the cross. There's glory because of the cross. Because of the sacrifice that was made at the cross. And there's glory because of it. And there's glory today. Jesus is victorious. I'm going to ask Sister Nimrod to bring a song this morning. Last thing to say this morning is hope in God. There are better days ahead. Hope in God. There are better days ahead. Look at verse 11, last verse in this chapter. He talks to himself again. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. He says the health of my countenance, the healing of my broken soul is when the face of my Savior is looking upon me, and the health of my countenance will be now what he has done on the inside will show up on the outside. Amen. Go ahead and play. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are so good. Thank you for your grace and for your love, for your kindness, for your loving kindness that you command in the daytime. Thank you for your song that's with us in the nighttime. Thank you that you are the cause and the source of hope and life. And the cross of Calvary is glorious and the resurrection is glorious. And the ascension of Jesus Christ is glorious and the hope of your soon return is glorious because there is glory with you, Jesus. So, oh, Father, for those people walking through deep places this morning, I thank you that deep calls to deep. Though the burden is real and the weight is heavy, you are a match for anything and greater than anything that we may face. Continue to minister this word. Bless it and multiply it to the souls that heard it this morning and to the ones who will hear it in the future. And Lord, speak to us and teach us, Lord, to speak of the things of God and the mercies of God and to stop listening to ourselves but listen to the God in heaven that loves us and gave himself for us. Jesus, thank you for everyone in this room. And everyone who will hear in the future, by whatever means, bless them and minister to them. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.